Good afternoon. I'm Chris Scherer, Member of Communications Director of the Society of Broadcast Engineers and the co-host of this month's episode of the SBE Web Extra, the SBE Chapter of the Web. This is a monthly SBE meeting usually held on the third Monday of the month. The SBE is the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals with about 5,000 members, mostly in the U.S., but also around the world. The SBE Web Extra is sponsored by Catrine. Catrine, unique experience, individual solutions, reliable performance. The host of today's SBE Web Extra is SBE board member Kirk Harnack, who is also the chair of the SBE Social Networking Committee. Good afternoon, Kirk. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Chris, uh, before I forget, I want to thank you so much for all the work that you do in putting these SBE Web Extras together. I do some work. Chris just Chris lifts the heavy loads, and I really appreciate it very much, Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you. This. This program, I can't take credit for. This was your idea, and uh, you've known our guest for a while, and uh, you're, you get the credit for setting this one up for sure. But I, I think some I previous I SB appreciate president, the recognition on the rest of the work. So I think some pre previous SB president uh, uh, persuaded me that this would be a good idea to do, and uh, I'd be sorry if I didn't. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm looking under... forward to it. So yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, by the way, Chris, uh, in your role with SBE now, you're not doing full-time engineering for any broadcast facilities. Um, uh, do you still get hands-on a soldering iron every now and then? Actually, I do. Uh, not necessarily. I'm not working on transmitters or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. I do some uh, volunteer AV work for an American Legion post here where I live, um, helping them out on some projects, which is Kind of funny because at least on the audio side it's as analog as you can get <laughs> yeah. um it's mostly work on their 25 volt distributed overhead uh pa system um and then a few other things that i get involved in here and there but i still do uh some work i, I do some live recording here and there um and i i do some some i'm a musician as well so i have to maintain that my equipment there as well, um, well yeah, so I, yeah i still have to fire up the soldering iron and, and do a little bit of work it's it's not I, I, uh, I audio the, over IP, but uh, <laughs> well, I, I see the amplifier right behind you. I'm thinking, hey, there, Chris probably pulls out. The reason I bring that up is because for years I've had these two Duro meters, and you know, one of them is not reading anything when I speak. The mm -hmm. other one is, and these are two separate Duro meters, but I've had them attached to the same uh, output of a mic preamp uh, for some years now. Well, this one just started reading mm, full scale all by itself. I unplugged it to keep it from doing, but I'm going to have to, I'll bet you we have some, uh, worn out capacitors in the power supply. And so we started getting some, you know, lots some noise in the, in the power rails and that started making it read. That's what I'm guessing. I don't have a schematic going to have to pull it out, but it, it's, it's not every day that I get to actually troubleshoot something. And so I kind of wondered if you did too. Once in a blue moon, and actually I'm still in contact. I, I certainly go to my local chapter meetings and I'm friends with a lot of the engineers in town. And once in a blue moon, I'll get a call saying, hey, I'd like an extra set of hands. Um, sometimes I'm just there as the spotter while somebody buries his head inside a transmitter and I'm just there as the extra body to make sure nothing happens. Um, or, you know, push the reset when I tell you to type thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do enough to keep dirty, I guess, here and there. Make sure nobody touches the uh, the breaker while I've gotten my head in here. Yeah, exactly. uh, we're going to have you do our member update in just a minute. But first, we're going to bring in somebody who is uh, probably knows which end of the soldering iron to hold. And that is Marcos O'Rourke. Marcos, welcome into this uh, to our show, uh, the SBE Web Extra. All right, thank you very much for having me and inviting me. Uh, give us the elevator pitch on uh, who Marcus O'Rourke is. Uh, well... That's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I am an engineer here in Southern California for a couple of stations owned by a church. And um, we have some amazing places that we've had transmitter sites on um, mountaintops, flatlands, all kinds of different places. But um, yeah, so I have a YouTube channel that I bring some of that ad adventure on and try to show the behind the behind the scenes and kind of get people who wouldn't be normally interested in that side of the business interested in that side of the business so ah so you, your videos really are not so much about educating 
engineers, although I guess that happens, you're more about educating people who don't know what you do, but maybe have some interest. And you're a great storyteller. Uh, in fact, you were awarded uh, something from the SBE, what is it, YouTuber of the Year? What, what was your award? <laughs> it was the Educator of the Year. Ah, yes, a prestigious award. Actually, yes, a, quite a prestigious award. Chris, I wonder if you could tell me anything about that that award. It's got a. It's named after someone, James Willeman. Is that right? Yeah, the the formal name of the award is the James C. Willeman SBE Educator of the Year. Jim Willeman mm -hmm. is a past president of the SBE, uh, listed as one of the fathers of our certification program. And several years ago, uh, our major awards were renamed after some of our SBE founding fathers. One of them being Jim Willeman. And Marcus is our most recent recipient of that honor. And uh, so the timing is perfect. Um, when you suggested we have him as a guest, I thought absolutely, uh, especially since we're getting ready for our national meeting uh, in uh, late September up in Syracuse, where we'll recognize all of our award winners, including Marcos. So we're happy to add him to those ranks. Awesome. Well, we're going to uh, see some of Marcos's work. If you're not familiar with his YouTube channel, you will be uh, familiar with a, a few of his videos at the end of, of by the end of, of this show. And Marcos has picked out some uh, things that are instructional and, and typical of his work in helping other people understand what goes on with a broadcast facility. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing these videos. I have not seen any of, of the first three that we're going to see. So that's coming up. But right now, Chris Shearer has for us a member update. So let's turn our attention to Chris. Go ahead. Yes, indeed. This is your SBE member update for August 15th, 2022. Webinars by SBE continues to add new programs to the schedule. There's one coming up this month on August 25th. It's called Audio Streaming for Broadcasters, Fundamental Techniques and Technologies. It's at 2 p.m. Eastern and it's led by Kirk Harnack. I think I know that guy. Also save September 8th for Redundancy Key to Successful EA oper EAS Operation. Larry Wilkins, the Director of Engineering of Services for the Alabama, Broadcast Alabama Broadcasters Association, leads the course, which will cover the history of EAS, FCC rules and guidelines for the creation and maintenance of a state EAS system. The key is ensuring the system is as redundant as possible and tested on a regular basis. Now, earlier this month, the eight-part CBNT CBNE study topics series concluded. Led by Wayne Piscina, the series is now available on demand. It's an ideal preparation to take the SBE, CBNT, or CBNE certification exams. For information on these and all the webinars by sbe.org slash webinars. On the certification side, the next SBE certification exam window at local SBE chapters is in November. The application deadline for that exam session is September 9th. If a local chapter exam is not convenient for you or just not possible because of in-person restrictions, private proctoring is available. More information on SBE certification is online at sbe.org slash certification. The SBE election is in its final days. SBE members must cast your votes by August 17th. That's Wednesday. Those members with a valid email address receive their ballot via email. The first notice was sent on July 15th. If you opted out of online voting, or we don't have a valid email address for you, your paper ballot was mailed to you. It only takes a few minutes to cast your vote. The slate of candidates is listed under news and headlines on the SBE website. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the SBE is in the middle of its preparations for the 2022 SBE National Meeting, which will be held September 28 and 29 in Liverpool, New York, which is near Syracuse. The National Meeting will be held in conjunction with the SBE 22 Broadcast and Technology Expo. The SBE will hold several meetings, including a meeting of the Board of Directors. The fall membership meeting will be streamed live, which is when the newly elected officers and directors will take their positions. The SBE Awards Dinner will also be held, and the many national award recipients, including our guests today, will be recognized for their achievements. Get all the details on the events at the SBE website, follow the link on the homepage, or go to News and Headlines. And that is your SBE member update for August 15th, 2022. Thanks a lot, Chris. All right, uh, Chris, we're about to uh, see some videos and talk to Marcos O'Rourke. I've known Marcos for, for several years. Uh, he's uh, actually friends with a couple of my uh, uh, colleagues and former colleagues at my employer, Telos Alliance. And um, uh, Marcos, I, you know, I 
used to make some videos about servicing transmitters and doing a few things around the the, the radio station. Uh, I, I have one about changing a blower in a in a uh, small FM transmitter, and it's got a lot of views. And I thought, well, you know, I thought pretty well of myself making these videos. They have a lot of interest. And then I saw your videos, and I thought, oh man. Look, uh, I got to up my game to even come <laughs> close to Marcos's videos. Your videos are just, first of all, they're stunningly gorgeous. They're well done. They're well narrated and they're interesting. So after all that, Marcus, <laughs> tell me uh, before we see our first video here, um, Marcos, if you would tell me about your, your motivation. Why do you spend your time making these videos about engineering? Uh, well, quite honestly, you know, I, I look around the room at, our chapter meetings at uh, NAB, and there aren't very many people, young people coming into the industry. And I know how important what we do is to keeping things going, to pushing uh, technologies forward, and kind of understanding the bigger technological scope of, of content creation and content delivery. I can't say broadcasting necessarily anymore because it's, you know, so much more than just your, your FM or AM broadcasting these days. Um, so my motivation really was finding a way to make what we do seem interesting, seem exciting, because I think it is. I mean, I absolutely love what I do. And to be able to share that excitement and that, and that uh, love that I have for content creation and delivery with others and hopefully inspire those to join the uh, the ever decreasing ranks of engineers. Why don't we uh, jump right in pretty quickly here? If you'll set up this first video, it, it, it's a bit lengthy. Uh, the other yes. videos that we're going to see are shorter. This one's about 13 minutes long. All good, uh, good content here, but w why did you choose to make this video and what's it about? Um, well, I was asked to make this video first, but um, you know, I kind of also went, you know, I think this is interesting because I do have some people who are engineers that follow me. And while my videos aren't geared toward the engineer, it's more geared more towards, I don't know, technical people, just not necessarily engineers. I figured, well, this is a good, you know, uh, insight into what we do. So I'm talking about a, a tool that we use that helps us to, uh, as you kind of mentioned it earlier, orchestrate some of the repetitive tasks or some of the more complex tasks that need to happen immediately um, in our facility and uh, kind of go into a little bit of the detail of this is what we do. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll have our producer Suncast uh, started up here about uh, automating certain things in the radio station, not about automation per se, like a broadcast playout automation, uh, but this is automating other, other tasks. So let's take a look and then we'll comment after. Hello, welcome to another video here. And what I am going to do is play for you a video that I produced for uh, a friend of mine who works at Broadcasters General Store. Let me get this out of the way. This is not sponsored. I'm gonna be talking about a product and about a company, and they have, they're not paying me for this. They have no editorial control over this. This is totally on my own because I am a fan. Yeah, I'm fanboying it a little bit. So sue me. Um, but anyways, so this is a video. A friend of mine asked me to make it to show how we use it, how we use this product, and I figured, why not? There are some of you who have Axia radio stations, so, you might benefit from seeing how I use it as well. So anyways, I'm gonna roll this video and enjoy. See you on the other side. Hi, I'm Marcos O'Rourke. I'm the chief engineer of K-Wave Radio and KSTW in Southern California. And we have a couple of stations, one an internet station, and we use Pathfinder Core quite a bit. So let me take you real quick through what we do. There's three things that we mainly use Pathfinder Core for, and that's logic flows, routers, and user panels. So let's take a look real quick at logic flows. So with logic flows, what we use, it's kind of a couple of ways. Uh, 
three different ways actually. So the first one is emergency alert system. So our EAS box normally sits outside of the air chain. And when it wants to go on the air, on the back there's a relay and that will tell Pathfinder, hey, I wanna be on the air. So what'll happen is it'll run through a logic flow and it will take whatever source it was routed to my internet stream processor, my Arbitron encoders, sorry, Nielsen encoders, uh, whatever other sources I have it set to, and it takes that EAS source and routes all of those different places at once. So let's look at my logic flow real quick. As soon as that pin goes low, then it will tell this logic flow, okay, the EAS audio source needs to go to all these different destinations. And then when that EAS pin goes high, when it's done putting itself on the air, then it will go back to the previous source that it had. So that's what we do for both, uh, for both of our stations that we have that are on the air for KWVE and for KSDW. Now, another thing that we do is in the mornings, we have a live show where pastors will call in via, via Skype, a specific pastor will call in via Skype, and they will have a conversation with our on-air talent at that time. Part of it is on the air, and then part of it is on the internet, and we will do a video stream of that as well. So, in order to reduce the amount of things that the morning person has to set up, so we have it automatically route from our Studio A program to bus straight into our video encoder. And that way, the person who comes in to run the video side of things doesn't have to worry about it, they don't have to think about it, it just happens. And then afterwards, it will reset and go back to whatever it was normally looking at for that video encoder. So we have our morning prep, and then we have our morning reset. Uh, we have a couple of other live shows where we have Monday through Friday, and we basically treat it like a satellite show, even though that we are generating the show, uh, we're originating the show, we will treat it as a satellite show on a couple of our stations. So. What'll happen is it will load a certain profile at a certain time, and then at that certain time, it will turn on a certain pot and put it on the air. And that works out really, really well. And we've had probably maybe one or two times where it didn't work right, and that was this problem right here. Yep. Uh, but it has, it has basically worked properly for us uh, without me getting in the way and tinkering with it. Uh, another thing that we do is for silence alarms, we will have a logic flow for setting off certain enunciators, alarms, lights, emails, uh, things like that that help us to notify our person who's in the studio that they're silent or that our other station is silent. And then it will also let us know, the engineering staff know that a station is off the air. We also have a logic flow for a two-way radio system. We have a two-way radio system for our engineering and coordination use. And through the Axia intercom panel, when you press a button, it will route that intercom panel's mic to the radio and do the push to talk relay and all that fun stuff. So we also do that. And we have a few uh, logic flows for that, for when somebody keys up outside, it will unmute the intercom panel so that way you can hear what's going on. So the next thing we use are the routers. And with routers, we make it easy for myself, my coworker, the other engineer, um, or even somebody that we can walk through to be able to make emergency path changes. And we're not giving them access to everything. We're giving them very specific access. So we've made virtual routers for many of our, for our, our two stations. But what will happen is they can select a destination and then they can make a change to that route. And then, well, for example, I will take this route here to our backup satellite uplink, change the route, and now I can see all of the different sources that I've made available to this virtual router. So I'm not giving them everything. I'm not giving them the microphone in the production room. I'm just giving them our program one sources for the different air studios. 
I'm giving them the automation, the individual automation channel. So if we just need to route that for a few moments. Um, so I can just take, for example, this source, Automation 3, and take. And now I've just routed that automation output straight to our backup satellite uplink destination. Pretty simple. And that's the second thing that we use with Pathfinder Core are the routers. Now the third thing we use are user panels. User panels are pretty cool. And as you can see, I've, I've got a few in here and that's years of playing with user panels. And the only user panel that I'm actually kind of proud of a little bit is uh, this one here, and I'm calling my, my large meter panel. Um, it shows me all of the important audio sources that we need to pay attention to and that we should monitor. For example, I have my studio program levels here. I have my uh, FM receiver at Santa Ana, the one at Santiago Peak, the one at Prado, which is our booster. And then for our, our second station, KSCW, again, our program one audio feed coming out of the studio here, the receiver at Palomar, the receiver at Woodson, all of our EAS sources. So I can see that we have EAS audio. And then I'm also looking at my downlink, satellite downlink audios as well. So that is what I have so far, user panels. I did make some other user panels in the past where um, I can reset the hallway light. Sometimes the reset was too quick for the logic flow to catch up. And so I can manually fire off that reset light. So we have that red light in the hallway that goes off. So I can manually reset that. And then I have a, a test panel for, we have a multicolored light enunciator in the main studio for the person who's there, who's there 24 hours a day. So that way we can test that the lights work. So those are my user panels. And that is how we use Pathfinder Core. I really, I honestly could not do what we do without it. It has saved me so much time, so much effort. And um, I really, this is an essential tool that we have for us. So. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. So that was the video. Not that exciting, I know. Kind of a little bit of a sales pitch-ish. Um, but honestly, you know, Pathfinder really is a tool that I could not do without. It has saved me so much time, so much effort. Um, everything I just said in that video was honest is true. And <laughs> I mean, it really, really has been helpful. And so um, there have been times where we had to take a studio off offline for whatever reason. And instead of going through and going to each individual web page for the Axia thing and routing the this and putting in the channel ID or search, I go into Pathfinder, I go to that router, I click that destination and I just say, okay, I need to go from the automation or I need to go from, you know, a different studio and feed that over the air. And boom, it worked. It did it. Uh, there were a couple of times in the past uh, where we had to simulcast um, some long programming over all of our stations and Without Pathfinder, it would have been laborious. It would have been messy on the air. Um, but all we had to do was back time to a specific time. I fire it off in Pathfinder. Boom, we're simulcasting. And then when we were done, again, the same thing. We ran it to a certain time. When that time hit, boom, I fired off Pathfinder. And now everybody went back to where they needed to. Yeah, it's a, it's a great tool. If you have a station, if you're using Axia, um, I honestly would say that it is worth the cost that it is. Um, they've just now come out with a virtual machine version. Hmm. 
as you know, I'm getting into virtual machines now, but uh, uh, we're actually, we have two appliance devices, so uh, I, think, I think we're good there. But, you know, it, it is a great product. It is a great uh, device. So if you are running a station that has Axia, I would strongly recommend it. All right. Well, and if you want to know more about Pathfinder and, and what it is more than what I've been talking about here, because it does so much more as well, I'm going to link a, uh, put a link in the description to uh, Telos Alliance's page on that. I am not, this is not a sponsored video. I am not being paid for this video. So I'm just a fan of their products and of this product specifically. So let's just be very clear about that. All right. Anyways, I've talked your ear off enough. Thanks for watching. We will see you guys uh, in the future. Next week? Sure. Why not? Happy New Year? Yeah. All right. Bye. Good, good music selection on those two. So, so Marcos, um, let's just wrap up on the topic of orchestration software. Uh, you've got Axios, so you got Pathfinder. Other manufacturers of, of different things, including television uh, IP systems and even non-IP systems um, have orchestration type of software. And this is something that it's it, what's, it's fairly new to those of us in radio. Now, if you run a big network, you probably have some, uh, you know, orchestration software to make lots of changes all at the same time. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're responsible for two, three, four, five, 12 radio stations and their signal flows at the same time, uh, you probably want something that can just hit everything all at once or, or do things automatically. So isn't, isn't that what, at least in part, yeah. what orchestration software is for? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like in some of those clips in the video, you see the logic flow and how many things that it does based off of one input. So to have to do that manually, wait, hang on, uh, click, 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 uh, five minutes later, uh, click, click, okay, go ahead. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 there is that. It, it, it turns out that at my own radio stations, I, I don't have the Pathfinder uh, system there because you know, we started out with little bitty radio stations. And uh, now and then I find myself thinking, you know, this sure would be easy if I had something to look at everything all at once, you know, but uh, maybe that, that'll come. Hey, uh, we ought to move right ahead to our next topic. It's some, some summertime. And that means uh, we all should give thanks to Mr. Carrier for inventing air conditioning. Uh, tell us about this next video on that topic. Uh, air conditioning, you know, it's it's always something at a site. And, you know, you got a good, a good chance that it's air conditioning at some point. Um, so at this site is one of our on-channel boosters. It covers this little two-mile area. And it's a little environmentally sealed box that's got a little air conditioning bolted to the side of it. Oh. And it gave up the ghost. So brought in a company to help us with that. And this was the resolution of that whole, whole fiasco of working with it and them finally replacing it. So, Okay. This video is much shorter. Let's take a, a look at this video now about air conditioning. Got a phone call today, and it was from our air conditioning guys. And they were saying, oh, by the way, we're here at Prado. Oops, um, I did not expect them to be here today. So I sent them an email and w you've seen the videos about this, um, the air conditioning problems we've had with the little box we have at Prado Dam. And it's our booster site that covers the 91 freeway, this little shadowed area from our main station. So uh, he gives me a call and says, hey, we're out here with the new air conditioning unit. And I said, oh, I wasn't uh, where you were gonna be coming out. So what had happened was an email I had exchanged with the office uh, had basically been misinterpreted, probably by me. And um, I was waiting for confirmation because the email basically said, hey, uh, just letting you know, we might be able to be out there on this date. And I never heard anything back and I never confirmed. So that one's on me. So anyways, drop everything. Let's go out there and let's get this uh, air conditioning unit installed. And, um, yeah, get things cool in that box again. So 
Sergio and Tim from ACO Engineering were waiting for me when I arrived. I let them in the gate, and they were off and running. The first thing they did was to remove the old air conditioning unit without damaging the equipment enclosure. Then it was time to pull the new unit out of the box and get it put together. They salvaged a couple of parts that were still in very good condition and we're going to keep those as a backup. They removed the old unit and began to prepare the cabinet for the new unit. The foam seal for the back of the unit was installed. The new unit is lifted, set into place, and secured. Cables were run and connected to provide power and telemetry. The cover was installed and all 50 million screws were put into place. Then power was connected and cool air began to flow. Some final programming of the controller for temperature set points, then clean up and head out. So the air conditioning guys just left and we have a new air conditioning unit on the side of the cabinet there. So it's wonderful, it's working, it's cooling things down, it's keeping things cool, and that is important. However, there's always a however, unfortunately. However, the transmitter is now not wanting to behave. Um, it's not coming up. It, I need to replace it anyways. It's got a lot of issues. So hopefully I can see if I can shake loose a new transmitter or see if somebody can let me borrow one for a while while I pull this one out and try to figure out what's wrong with it. <sighs> it's always something. It's always something. All right. Well, thanks for watching today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of this channel. And uh, while you're here, subscribe and uh, maybe watch some of these videos. Maybe, maybe this one, maybe, maybe this one. Um, yeah. Anyways, until next time, stay safe, stay warm, stay healthy, stay cool. It's getting warm. All right. Bye. Marcus, I, I know that your purpose here isn't to, uh, to really to speak to engineers, but I'm curious about the make and model of that small air conditioner. We've seen the big, you know, barred brand air conditioners that are hung on the side, typically of, of uh, cellular buildings back when they had buildings. Now they're getting smaller too. What right. was, the, what was that unit that, that you replaced? Uh, it's made by a company called ice cube. Uh, okay, so the rack itself is called, uh, is from a company called DDB unlimited. Hmm. And one of the options is the air conditioning unit. And that's what they specify on there. And they cut all the holes for it. And, and basically ship it like that. Yeah. So obviously replaced it with exactly the same model that was in there before. Same model, same everything. Um, does Fortunately, it they still any... make it because it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do they give? Does it give you any telemetry other than temperature and whether it's on or off? It doesn't even give me that. It I, it oh. has an alarm relay, and that's mm -hmm. about it. So I can't see anything else, but I have temperature probes inside the box to know what okay. the temperature is. So, which is good. And that alarm relay is probably not very specific. It probably just says it, I have a problem, and that's all. Exactly. <laughs> very generic relay. Yep. Fortunately, this is an uh, easy site to get to, but yeah. Oh, good. Okay, good, good. Um, does uh, where's the fil? I, I didn't see. Well, where's the filter on that thing, or does it have one? Uh, if you were standing up against the fence, it would be uh -huh. like on the bottom left side. Mm. Okay. The little okay. filter that slides on there. Yeah. Interesting. All right. All right. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, I, hey, by the way, I, I, I love the, 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 uh, the gentle, easy flow and music that you put on these. <laughs> what, uh, tell me, uh, we're going to do a video. Uh, our last video we're going to watch is about 
how you produce these, but tell me a little bit about your music selection. I always feel like I'm watching something really professional based on uh, <laughs> all the, you know, not just the content, but but the background music. Uh, my background music, it kind of, uh, I, I don't mean it to be so wishy-washy, but I mean, it's how I feel when I'm making that video. Um, some of the videos where we've gone through the desert is kind of a, a Western kind of sound to it. Um, you know, trying to be a little bit fun with it, trying to make it a little bit more entertaining. And uh, the music that I choose is there to support uh, the story, to support what the visuals are. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's just better than having silence or even, even natural sound with it. Because yeah. having the guys opening the package, it's just like, okay, that's exciting. Put good music now, behind it, and maybe it's a little bit more exciting. To to me, it's 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 another cut above in video production when some of your audio narration is is live on the camera, and mm. other audio narration is done. You do it in post production. How do you decide when you're going to explain something in post versus explain it live on camera? It. Depends on what it is. So when I'm, especially when I'm dealing with vendors and it's not me being able to explain it in the situation, then I will edit it in within mind of how I want to tell this story, of how I want to mm -hmm. explain what's going on. And then I'll kind of write out a little script and uh, record it on either my desk microphone here or I have a little micro recording studio at home in my closet but yeah it's it's really just how do i want to tell that story and if if i am focusing on somebody else which is for me much more preferred but if i'm focusing on somebody else how can i tell that story later on so yeah hey I, one thing i noticed about the uh, air conditioning video is Whenever you had shots of the gentleman installing the the new unit, taking the old one out, putting the new one in, uh, they look like long shots, like you were like you were standing some distance away and you had to zoom in. Were would it have been uncomfortable to be right up there with them in close shots for the most part, or or, or did, I, did yeah. I do it wrong? Uh, no, no, actually, that was a very good, very good observation. Um, so I do have a zoom lens, um, but how tight it is, especially at that site. For me to be up there with them would have just put me in the way. And, yeah. you know, I try not to be in the way as much as I try, as much as I can. <laughs> I know. Um, I make a better door than a window, you know, the whole big <laughs> saying. But, uh, you know, if, if I can have a longer shot, you know, so that way I'm out of the way for safety or for convenience, then I'll do that instead. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we have uh, one more one more educational video before we look at a behind the scenes. Uh, how do I do this video? Tell me about uh, this video about doing a what a remote broadcast uh, uh, for Easter. So this was this is our biggest broadcast that we do each year, um, and we basically set up a. It's basically a remote, but we want to go through our own network infrastructure since it's here on campus. Um, we're in a six-story building where the radio station is, and the broadcast happens over at the church, and it's usually not in a place where they normally do their services. So we set up some microwave, and anyways, you'll see it here, but this is kind of what we go through to make this broadcast be the most reliable and the most, um, we, we set up redundant links just to make sure that it is reliable. So, yeah. All right, well, let's take a look. Roll it, Suncast. Hello and happy Easter. It is that time of year again for our biggest outside broadcast of the year. Now, I am on top of our six-story building roof. Why? Well, because, let me show you this. Because of our microwave link. This is the micro half of the microwave link that goes down all the way over to the church uh, where they're gonna be doing the sunrise service and uh, that's how we get our, our audio back and forth uh, from down there to up here to the studio, which is a couple of floors down below me. I did this side, I'm sorry. I got a little excited yesterday and I had to get this all set up, but uh, I forgot to bring you along. So let's get the other side set up 
and um, that way at least got you guys along for that side. And we'll talk about what we do for our, our broadcasts, and you can see previous years of what we've done. This year is going to be a different, but a little bit simpler. So anyways, let's go, follow along. So we're in the rack room, as you can kind of see here, and you don't, yeah. anyways, this is kind of where my RPU receiver lives. I don't have it up on the roof. I, I, I want to get it up there eventually, and that's a project on the, on the books, but um, the receiver is actually here in my old office, which I'll show you here in a second. And I just kind of have it, the antenna leaning up against the window. And then I have cables here that I'll stretch out because we don't use the RPU very often. So in here, it's, it is a literal disaster. I mean, all these computers that we've pulled out, it's, it's all stuff that needs to be gone. But over here on the floor is the RPU receiver and that's the antenna. And so what I'll do is I have this cable here that I just string out and plug into the RPU receiver over here. Here's all the gear and goodies that we're gonna be taking out to where we're setting up the remote at. Uh, we have my RPU stuff, I have the microwave stuff, yeah, we should be good to go. Oh, I need to grab the Comrex unit too to make a test. All right, well, let's uh, let's get this going. on top of the Fellowship Hall roof, because this is where I need to put my microwave link. Walking all the way over here to the corner to see if I can see. Yeah, there's the building. Line of sight. Ugh. Okay. Ah. Uh. So, as you can see, let me move out of the way. As you can see, uh, I've got this side set up now. And the top is the RPU antenna, the bottom is the microwave antenna on this side. And so, uh, I've got my RPU hooked up. I forgot to grab a big spool of cable. So, I have a big spool of cable now to connect the microwave downstairs to the uh, power device, the indoor unit. All right, well, let's get that part set up. Okay, so I have my microwave indoor unit connected up all the way up to the outdoor unit that's up on top of the roof right now. And now I have my RPU transmitter here. And let's hook up the antenna. I just want to hook up an antenna to a transmitter or a dummy load. Okay, and connect power. Ta da! And go one. And then I'm going to come out of the line out from the Comrex unit into the input of the RPU unit. So that way 
Uh, that way if I lose my data connection, I still have the RPU connections. And then, worst case, if I lose the Comrex, I just unplug from the Comrex and plug into the front of the RPU. It has a mixer on it, so. Now, I need LAN connection. Let's connect that to the microwave. Indoor unit here. And then we can power everything up. Alright, it is 3.58 in the morning. Just pulled up, have my coffee, and going to grab all of our stuff and then cart it all the way over so that way uh, we can get the connection set up. Well, the service is over, and now it's time to take down our microwave link. See, here it is. I already got the one piece off. Now to uh, get the microwave part off. Thanks for watching today, I appreciate it. Today is Easter Monday, so I'm putting the finishing touches on this video last minute. So again, thanks for watching. Um, you know, these Easter setups just seem to be getting easier and easier as, as each year goes on. So this year was actually fairly easy and things went amazingly smooth according to plan. I really can't complain. That was great. So anyways, uh, <laughs> coming up we have some really exciting uh, things happening. We have a generator replacement on top of the building. We have the NAB show uh, next week. So that's gonna be exciting and I should probably have several videos available for that. So anyways, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If not, eh, so sorry. If you wanna see more of these, subscribe and stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you next time. Um, I want to remind you uh, that YouTube channel that Marcus has, Marcus, you, you can you can tell us what what's it called. Sure, it's a SoCal Broadcast Engineer. And, and you know what? I'm For years, my, my my crazy dyslexia misread that. I thought it was Social Broadcast Engineer, but no, it's SoCal, as in Southern California, right? I may look social. I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> Are you as introverted as many engineers are? Oh, so, so <laughs> introverted, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, I'm a little curious about your miking technique, and maybe you'll cover that in our in the last video about some behind-the-scenes stuff. But uh, like when you were on the rooftop looking back at the y the Marty Yagi antenna and the, the uh, IP radio antenna, um, you turn away, and the audio would get a, a little duller, and you turn toward the camera. and it got, So I'm thinking that there must have been a mic on your left hand side or a shirt sleeve or something somewhere what's going on uh for that one specifically no i only had one mic um ah. two different cameras though so the first half of the video was with my bigger mirrorless camera and the second half of the video when i was tearing it down was all with my cell phone so ah. that was the little yeah. mic on the back of it how speaking of cell phones uh you know <laughs> that photographers always used to say, hey, the best, uh, the best phone to carry with you is the one you have with you. So yes. um, can, uh, if, if another engineer is interested, hey, I'm doing a pretty interesting project today. I think I'll document this and make a little video of it later. Is, is, is a cell phone camera good enough to actually do a good job? Oh my gosh. What we have in our pockets today is amazing. It's so much better than anything that we've ever had in the past, obviously. But I mean, you can record 4K video. Mm -hmm. The hard part is getting good audio. And that way, uh, because if you don't have good audio, people won't really stick around 
because yeah. they want to hear what's what you're saying. They want to hear what's going on, and especially like in a noisy transmitter uh, room, having a mic on a camera that's five, six feet away, or even two or three feet away, it's really hard to hear. So the closer that microphone can get, like I have a wireless microphone that I use sometimes when I'm at a transmitter site, just so I get it closer here so you can actually hear what I'm saying. It, it, are th aren't there um, wireless mics that maybe have an adapter to go into, say, a lightning connector or a USB-C oh, yeah. connector? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, okay. I use the little Rode wireless go that's right ones. but you can get the little lightning adapter and it record it that uses that audio when you record the video so yeah yeah yeah, yeah I've, I've had pretty good uh, luck with uh, with those and another technique is what we talked about earlier and that is you do a post-production voiceover mm -hmm. if you're in a super noisy location just plan on talking over it uh yeah. when you're ed editing the video even as simple as sitting in the car hitting the voice memo and talking into the, your, your cell phone. Oh, yeah. Because the mics on these are pretty good. Not, you yeah. know, I wouldn't use it necessarily for a commercial project, but something like this, they're great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, you didn't really, I mean, you weren't, you weren't going around asking people to nominate you for educator of the year from the SBE. And that's, that's <laughs> part of the reason we brought you on is because you, you're about to receive that honor. Uh, at the meeting in, in Syracuse. Um, you're, you're doing this because because you like to tell people what you do. Yeah, I, I enjoy what I do. There's not enough uh, visibility into what we do. And I'm just trying to, again, like I said earlier, get more pe more techie-minded people into the industry that, that we do because it is very important. And it's we're having that hard time of refilling these, these uh, spots. So... Yeah. Well, uh, uh, by the way, on your YouTube channel, SoCal Broadcast Engineer, uh, let me encourage uh, you to uh, you as an audience to go uh, like and subscribe to that channel. Hit Thank the you. little notification thing where it'll it'll uh, let you know about it. Um, uh, I, I does that go all the way back to your first your first video? For the most part, yeah. Um, yeah. I did have to move channels um, because my intended audience had changed. So my original intended audience was here at the station, just like, hey, this is what, what I do. And because, you know, you get that question. So what do you do? Like, oh, well, you know, and you can sit yeah. there for five minutes and explain it. And, <laughs> you know, it just when you're off roading on a on a Polaris vehicle on the side of a hill in snow, it's, it's hard to explain. And so, you know, oh, well, here, just watch this video. And they're like, oh, OK. Well, let's check out this last video. This is some behind the scenes, uh, uh, both explaining motivation, but also what's some of the gear that you use. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. A lot of the gear and process that I do. So. Ah, okay. Suncast, let's roll it. Then we'll be back with uh, me and, and Chris Shearer and Marcus O'Rourke to, to wrap it up and talk about it. So some of you asked what my process is with recording and filming and all that fun stuff. So let's go through it real quick. And now there's a lawnmower behind me. Okay. I'll talk real quick like this. And as soon as I get to the lawnmower stops, the airplane's gonna fly over. <laughs> okay, so I'm filming on a Canon R5C. Uh, that's what I have right here. Started off on my iPhone with some moment lenses and then I was on a Canon M50 uh, because I like the optics a little bit better. And then I moved to a Canon R, uh, EOS R, and now the R5C gives me 4K, 8K if I really wanted it, but I don't do 8K, but 4K. Um, has some great tools for uh, making sure I have good exposure, um, waveform, uh, um, vector scope, all that fun stuff, um, and also does stills. So it lets me have a hybrid camera. So there's, there's the camera. I'm using a Rode Video NTG as my microphone that's on camera. And then I also have the Rode Wireless Go. And I have it kind of with the split. So I do left channel is the shotgun mic right channel is the lapel mic and usually I'll have it uh, hidden inside my shirt with some uh, camera what's called undercover or whatever it is sticks to the shirt so you don't really see it so it looks a little bit neater um, for my drone shots some of those drone shots that I have I have a DJI mini 2 and that thing's a lot of fun it's a blast to fly 
And so I'll fly that around. It takes a lot of practice uh, to get the shot that you want. And uh, just to be spatially aware what your limits are, what its limits are. And so get but some amazing photos and, and video that I've gotten from that. Um, then I also have some cameras, uh, some GoPro cameras, a GoPro Hero 7 Black and the GoPro Hero 5 Session, which is a little square one, which didn't, they didn't use very often, or they didn't have for very long. Um, lighting is important. I have a bunch of reflectors. I have some uh, relatively cheap lights that I got off of Amazon um, that help me control the light, because that's all that video is, is just moving pictures, and lighting is key. Um, so when I go into the process, before I get to, to that day, I think about what it is I want to shoot, what it is that I'm going to be doing, what my tasks are, and how I'm going to set up those shots from my open and intro hook to my little travel montage, if I have one, to what the tasks are, the major tasks are for that day, and how I will set up my camera, my lights, uh, and my shot, and how I want it to look. Not always 100% effective or, or, you know, uh, executing the vision that I have, but I get close. Um, again, I still have a lot to, a lot to learn about, about it. So, um, so I go through that, I think about it, I shoot it. Um, usually it makes the task go a little bit longer than, you know, it normally would if you're not doing that. Um, and then what? And then I'll take my footage, unload it onto my, my MacBook M1. MacBook Pro M1 chip. Um, I'll also copy it to an external hard drive for safety. And then I will edit on Premiere Pro. Um, I like the Adobe Suite. I have really gotten used to it. It's uh, Premiere Pro, uh, After Effects, and um, um, the audio one, and Adobe Audition. So those three together are my, my video editing side. And I'll take all my footage, look at it, and then construct a story because that's really what I'm trying to do is tell a story about what it is that I'm doing. So, um, construct the story, put that together, edit it, find some good music. I use a service called Epidemic Sound as well as a service called Audio, A-U-D-I-I-O. And um, because both of those are licensed, I can use them on YouTube without getting copyright strikes or um, getting, you know, monetization claims. So. I'm able to make a, a couple of dollars to help try to pay for some of this equipment. Then, so I will edit everything together, try to create the story arc, and then um, I'll do color correction. Um, this is what it looks like when I shoot it. It is very flat, it is very gray, low contrast, but it allows me to have more control over my highlights and over my shadows. Uh, I will put a transform LUT on there, a color space transform and then I will put in some corrections and then a final look LUT on top of that to give it the coloring that I want it to. Then I will export. Usually that takes anywhere from five minutes to two hours, depending on how complex the video is, uh, how much effects I have, uh, what other layers that I have, sound effects. Um, and then from that point, I will upload it to YouTube uh, at least a day before I release it to allow YouTube to do its uh, cross, um, not cross contamination, uh, where it encodes it for different formats, different bit rates. Um, and then by the time it's ready to go for release, I have a 4K version, a 1080 version, all that that YouTube automatically creates. Um, creating a thumbnail that's visually interesting, tells a bit of the story, but kind of grabs your attention. I write a title which is not clickbait, but is kind of clickbait-y. Something that looks interesting. Um, if there's a description that I need to put in there, put in the description, tags, um, location sometimes, uh, my monetization options, um, and then the end screen where it has the suggested videos. And then um, I set a schedule, okay, release at this date at this time. And then away it goes, and then when it releases, I just interact with comments after that and start planning for the next video. It's a lot. It's a, it's a big process and I'm still learning on how to do it and how to try to make it efficient and yet still tell a good story that's educational and uh, entertaining and um, 
yeah, that's my process. <laughs> wow. It sounds like a lot, but you know, I'm familiar with the things you're talking about. So once you do it, it's, it's not, not that bad. Yeah. And then I didn't really think about what was involved until I made that video. And I'm, at the end, I'm just going, oh my gosh, that is a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a, a fair amount of that, YouTube, when you publish something on YouTube, it you fill in the blanks. It kind of walks you through a lot of that stuff. And some of it comes yeah. from learning, like using music that's not going to get you a strike because it's already known to YouTube as mm -hmm. something that is that they're not going to DMCA strike you about, right? Yeah, these, these uh, little music services are great. You sign up for them. Usually it's like, okay, anything on our catalog you can use. And uh, it like whitelists your channel. So if, if the YouTube system goes, hey, your song showed up here, their, um, whatever their backend system will say, no, they're okay. So they won't yeah. put a claim oh, okay. on my on my channel or my videos. Gotcha. Yeah, I've, I've had a claim made, and I, ha I had to send the receipt to YouTube. Say, Look, I paid for it here, and it says I can use it on YouTube. So, yeah. Chris, I heard you heard you pop in there. You have any, any questions for Marcos? Well, I've done a few videos and I get around it by writing my own music. So ah! well, there you go. Difference. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the videos I've done for the SBE, you hear a recurring theme song that I, I, I put together. I call it Engineered in Five because it oh, is yeah. in five, four time. Oh, cool. Um, and I've used yeah. it quite a bit. But you know what? There's no copyright issue to worry about. It's mine. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've it's heard really that. Hour. Yeah. You told me about this before. This is great. Good deal. Uh, maybe I can have you write a couple of tunes for my channel. <laughs> All right, M Marcos, I'm, I'm afraid we are slap out of time, but uh, let me congratulate you, Marcos, for uh, uh, being uh, uh, awarded this this honor. The uh, uh, what is it, Chris Wooleman? I always Willeman, forget Wooleman's first name. Engineer of the Year Award, Thank Educator you. of the Year Thank Award. You. I mean. Thank you, Educator of the Year Award. That's awesome. Well, thank you, uh, well, Thank Marcus, you very much. Thank you for your talents and sharing them with the rest of the engineering community and, and those who aren't, you know, quite up to speed on, on engineering. So it's great uh, introduction, you know, for fresh engineers, new engineers, young engineers, high school, college students who may be interested in moving this direction. Hey, I might be able to like to do something in broadcasting or, as you said, in content creation to cover a, 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 a larger gamut of what's going on. So, uh, Marcus, I, if you're going to be in Syracuse, I hope to be there, too. So I look forward to seeing you there and uh, congratulating you. Planning on it? Flights are booked. Okay, I need to. I need to book mine. Chris, will you? <laughs> I guess you're going to be there. It's part of your job, right? Yeah, I'll be there. I'm, it's part of my job, as you said. So, yeah, I haven't booked my flights, but I'm about to. So, well, well, Chris, uh, we are out of time. So, why don't you take us out of the show? We are. And again, thanks, Marcos, for being here. This was uh, interesting and fun. And thank you, Kirk. This has been the SBE Web Extra, the SBE chapter of the Web. We present it monthly, and we hope you'll join us each time. We'll post the replay on our YouTube channel, usually within a day. The SBE Web Extra is sponsored by Catrine, whom we thank for the support. Catrine, unique experience, individual solutions, reliable performance. If you hold SBE certification, viewing the SBE Web Extra qualifies you for one half point in category G, that's attendance. It's just like attending a local chapter meeting. And if you have an idea for a topic or a guest for the SBE Web Extra, send it to us at webextra at sbe.org, and we'll appreciate the suggestions and ideas. And that does it for this installment of the SBE Web Extra from the Society of Broadcast Engineers, the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals. Thanks again to our guest, Marcus O'Rourke, and on behalf of Kirk Harnack, we'll see you next month.